Luke, his name means light, and so God wants to give light even today. The light of grace. Grace is a special theme of this book, and let's read from verse 39 to verse 56. It is the third painting we have in these chapters. And Mary, rising up in those days, went into the hill country with haste to the city of Judah, and entered into the house of Zacharias, and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass, as Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and cried out with a loud voice, and said, Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ear, the babe leaped with joy in my womb. And blessed is she that has believed, for there shall be a fulfillment of the things spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has looked upon the low estate of his bondmaid. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is to generations and generations to them that fear him. He has wrought strength with his arm. He has scattered haughty ones in the thought of their heart. He has put down rulers from thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty. And he has helped Israel, his servant, in order to remember mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abram, and to his seed forever. And Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her house. So far the reading of the scripture. You remember that uh, in chapter 1 and 2 we have the picture of the remnant in those days, and that's why we have many practical lessons for a remnant today, a remnant in dark days. These were very dark days, and at the end of chapter 1, we will see that the light comes, the day spring from on high has visited us. So we started with very dark days at the beginning, and now the dawn is coming, and uh, light will shine, especially when we come to chapter 2, the birth of the Lord Jesus. Then we have seen that chapter 1 and 2 give us 10 paintings, and it's ordered in this way that number 1 stood on itself, and then we have 2 and 3 go together. We come tonight to the third painting. And then we will have the next time Lord willing four and five together. And so that brings us into chapter two where we have five more paintings. Luke was perhaps a painter beside all the other qualities he had, a doctor, a historian, a sailor, a wonderful man. There was another thing mentioned and that is this. In Luke's gospel we have much emphasis on the praise that goes to God. And tonight we have read two uh, doxology praises. And chapter 1 and 2 we will find in total seven of these praises. That is very interesting to see in those dark days seven different praises. And that uh, again shows us how intimately Luke is linked with the Apostle Paul. If you study Paul, you find many doxologies uh, where he exclaims and uh, praises God. Uh, and even in his prayers, Ephesians 1 and 3, Colossians, prayer leads to worship and doxology. So that is an, a prominent theme in Luke. We see that people glorified God. And so we see this in these doxologies. Doxology really means a glorification of God. In verse 39, we come then to this third uh, painting where we have Mary rising up in those days, went into the hill country. Now notice first it says the hill country. So she came all the way down from Nazareth in Galilee. We talked about Galilee uh, another time. And then she went down past Samaria, Sychar probably, where the Lord has been with the woman at the well in John 4, later. Then she went down past Jerusalem and went down even further to the hill country, which is probably the area of, of Hebron. Hebron was the a city of the priests, a very special city and also a city of refuge. We mentioned last time in Galilee was a city of refuge, in Samaria was a city of refuge, and Judah was a city of refuge. We cannot prove it for sure because there were also many priests uh, living very close to Jerusalem. And of course there were also hills around Jerusalem. Either way, it is a hill country. And that is a beautiful suggestion because the hill country 
things happened for the glory of God, as we will find also after John was born, much was spoken in the hill country. It's uh, emphasized two times in this chapter. That's an interesting point. And if we can apply this now to us, uh, God wants us to be in the hill country. The hill country speaks of an area where people are close to God. So are we living in the hill country in this sense that we are really close to God, like the priests who are living there, and the people, as we find in the, in the end of chapter 1, talking about these things, talking about what the Lord had wrought. Then we come to verse 40. Oh, I forgot one more point. She went with haste. This word uh, sometimes is translated with zeal. So you see here the spiritual energy with which Mary went. And that is beautiful. We have seen the last time some beautiful qualities in Mary. And of course we don't want to exalt Mary. But what we need to understand, there are beautiful qualities we find in her. Humble girl, young lady, there were beautiful qualities. And we see this coming out also tonight in this praise that we have from that we have read from verse um, 46 to verse 56. And so, what I would like to suggest, we find so many challenges for us in the, in a painting like this that God would show us this painting and would say, "Now look at this. How does this affect you?" Of course, we see also that in many ways these pictures present a details of future events, uh, the future remnant, where God will be glorified among the remnant. But to us today, we can take those paintings and learn many lessons uh, for us. For example, this spiritual zeal. For example, what we had the last time where we closed this, this commitment, and also that she was available. Behold, verse 38, the bondman of the Lord. This is a tremendous challenge for us. And a lesson, are we available? If the Lord says, do this, are you available? The Lord wants you to uh, distribute some tracts. Are you available? The Lord wants you to help someone in, in, the, in the house. See, there are many practical lessons we can draw from this. He is available for the Lord. And we notice she is a bondmaid. Her will is, made, is subject to God's will. And that really brings in joy. Can I say, suggest this? The obedience that we see in Mary is the key for joy. Today there is so much dissatisfaction so much unhappiness. But what is the problem? The problem is lack of obedience. If there is obedience, if there is this spirit of bondmanship, as we find here in Mary, a bondmaid, then there can be joy. And so we, we, we find that submission is the first key for joy. And we will see then also, the second key is that she can share. We have noticed the last time that the angel encouraged Mary by saying in verse 36, Behold, Elizabeth, thy kinswoman, she also had conceived a son in her old age. So that was a special situation that she was barren and could not have a child. She passed the age and yet she would have a child. So that was a special intervention and that was an encouragement for Mary to whom even greater miracles would uh, happen. So my point is now she can share some things with Elizabeth. Uh, God had worked in Elizabeth and God had worked in Mary. I mentioned the last time, the veil is put over this mystery of the Incarnation. It's only said in verse 35, the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. That's the mystery of the Incarnation. But then the veil is closed. But now she has something to share with Elizabeth. And that's a joy. If we can share with one another something that the Lord has shown us from the Scripture. Something that we really see as a wonderful blessing. We can share with one another, and that gives joy. So, it's a second reason for joy. And tonight we will also see that she enjoys in the fulfillment of the Scriptures. She quotes a lot the Scriptures, and she enjoys then in the fulfillment of the Scriptures. And she enjoys in the fact, we will see that in verse 47, that God is her Savior. My spirit has rejoiced in God my, my Savior. By the way, I underlined it so much, in those dark days that we are just talking about, there was great joy. This young sister, this young believer, was marked by great joy. And it is because of obedience. And then she could share her experience with another believer who had learned certain things in the school of God. Then she enjoyed the salvation in verse 47. And then she enjoyed the fulfillment of God's word, as we find in the end of the doxology. 
So this spiritual energy that we find here in Mary would also be a great encouragement for us, even in dark days or in days where you say, well, what use is it? What use is it to be marked by spiritual energy? And then verse 40, she entered the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. When I read this verse, uh, I thought of this little remnant in Malachi. In Malachi 3, you find this beautiful picture of those two and three who are there. And it says in Malachi 3, verse 17, and they, okay, verse 16, then they that feared Jehovah spoke often one to another. And Jehovah observed it and heard, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared Jehovah and that thought upon his name. And they shall be unto me a peculiar treasure, says Jehovah of hosts, in the day that I prepare. So I was thinking of this. This is an illustration of what we have in Malachi 3. This visit of these two sisters illustrates the truth of Malachi 3, verse 16 and 17. And she saluted Elizabeth. What joy this will have been to uh, meet one another. Knowing, Mary knew that God had worked a special miracle in Elizabeth. But now, notice, Mary did not know, excuse me, Elizabeth had no revelation from an angel that Mary had, re- had become pregnant. The mystery of the incarnation, she didn't know anything about that. But the Holy Spirit worked here in two ways. The Holy Spirit works, first of all, in the babe. It leaped in her womb. And then the Holy Spirit also worked in Elizabeth. Notice that. That's very remarkable. So, Mary was already instructed by the angel. But now, the Holy Spirit takes over. And the Holy Spirit works, first of all, in the babe. According to what was said already in chapter 1, verse 15, He shall be great before the Lord, and he shall drink no wine, and so on. And he shall be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. So there you see what was predicted by the angel, and here you see already the first fulfillment of this. Now when we read a verse like this, uh, immediately our thoughts go to what John said himself later, when his ministry almost uh, concluded. He said a wonderful thing in John 3 verse 29. He said, He that has the bride is the bridegroom, but a friend of the bridegroom which stands and hears him rejoices, notice again joy, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. And now my point, this my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, I must decrease. That is one of these must in John 3. Must be born again, and I say this for some who may be here, or one who may be here who is not sure whether he is saved. You must be born again, otherwise you cannot see the kingdom of God. And then the Son of Man must be exalted, his sacrifice, and then in our daily lives, in our own lives, he must increase. So that is already indicated here. The babe leaped in her womb. There was a response to the greatness of our Lord Jesus. He must increase. But the second point is Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit controls her in saying, leading her tongue. One more thing I wanted to underline. The babe, there's a word used in the Greek text that is used only eight times in the New Testament. That word is found four times in chapter 1 and 2. Two times in connection with John the Baptist, two times in connection with the Lord Jesus. It said in connection with Timothy that from his young childhood he had been uh, trained in the word of God, as I just my own words. From early childhood there's the same word used, and that shows that even very young children can be trained in the things of the Lord and should be trained in the things of the Lord. And another reference to this word babe, we all need to be babes. In what sense? You know that? We all need to be babes all the time to have the desire of a young babe for the milk of the mother. The same desire as a babe has for, for the milk of, her, of his mother or her mother, the same desire should mark us as believers to have a desire for the word of God. In that sense, we should all be babes. And then we will also respond to the greatness of the Lord Jesus. Now Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and cried out with a loud voice in verse 42. Uh, we noticed already that the word great, literally it says great voice. There is in Luke many, many references to great. Great prophet, a great voice. And here, in connection with this praise, 
in this doxology, but first of all the uh, salutation, there is this great voice. I just say this is a little detail, but uh, Luke puts much emphasis on these little details, and they are uh, wonderful. If you see, it's our word mega, uh, we understand that, and this word, or connected with, uh, with other words, is found seven times, just in chapter one and two, seven times, there's a reference to greatness. And then she says, blessed art thou. So she says to Mary, blessed, what does that mean? You can translate the word, blessed means speak well of. And so Elizabeth could speak well of Mary. And it's wonderful that the same word is used also with, rela- with regard to God, that we can speak well of God, we can bless God. And we need to distinguish this from another word we find later in verse 45, blessed is he that believes. There another word is used that we find 15 times in Luke's Gospel, 10 times in, in, in Matthew. These are two different words. So the one word emphasizes speak well of or pray. The other word is used, for example, in the Beatitudes. In Matthew 5, nine times this word is used, which we find in verse 45. In English, it is translated both blessed. You could translate happy. There is the emphasis on the happiness, where the first word emphasizes pray and speak well of. Blessed are thou amongst women. We talked a little bit about that already the last time, that the immense favor that Mary experienced to be chosen by God, to be a vessel for God, for this special task that she would be the mother of the Messiah. And so Elizabeth goes on to say, Blessed the fruit of thy womb. Perhaps this is the occasion also to point out that the Lord Jesus would be the seed of the woman. In Genesis 3 we find the first reference The first prophecy, really, the seed of the woman. And here we see the fulfillment. He is the fruit of Mary's womb, the seed of the woman. At the same time, we see he is the seed of David, he is the seed of Abraham. But I just draw your attention to him as the seed of the woman. And we talked about it the last time. It's not a man, a male, that would be his father. It's the Holy Spirit who fathered him, God himself. And so this is the mystery of the Incarnation, which is implied even here in this description, blessed the fruit of thy womb. And then she says, when is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? But this is a wonderful statement. So let me emphasize once more that Elizabeth did not have a revelation from the angel. Elizabeth was led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit made it clear to her, perhaps through the fact that the babe lived in her womb. But how, we don't know, but she was instructed that Mary was already at that moment pregnant and expecting to be the mother of the Messiah. And that is why Elizabeth would say, Blessed the fruit of thy womb. And then immediately, and that is another point to notice, when is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? So this keeps the balance. On the one hand, the fruit of thy womb emphasizes the humanity of the Lord Jesus. Verse 43 emphasizes his deity, you see? And that balance we find all the time through the scriptures. Even in Luke's Gospel, where there's so much emphasis on the humanity of the Lord Jesus, there's always this balance that at the same time he is God blessed forever. And even here in this description or in this exclamation, the mother of my Lord, there is this thought implied, because the word curious is really the Greek translation of the word Yahweh, or Jehovah, as we have in uh, some translations in the Old Testament. The uh, Lord in the Old Testament, the relationship of the Lord with Israel, is the same Lord he's talking about. So it's God. It's a reference here to God himself. And so you see, verse 42, the fruit of thy womb is humanity. Verse 43, his deity. But then another point. She could say, my Lord. So that shows he was saved. He had a relationship with God. And she could now submit herself in a special way to my Lord. She could say that this, she enjoyed this personal relationship. Do we enjoy such a personal relationship? Notice the faith of Elizabeth. Before the Lord Jesus was born, she could already say, my Lord. And after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, in John 20, we see another sister, Mary of Magdala, healed by the Lord during his ministry on this earth. And after the resurrection, when 
Nobody believes yet in the resurrection. She met the Lord Jesus and she uses the same expression, my Lord. I don't know where it is led, my Lord. She's speaking about him. She did not recognize him yet. He was risen. He stood in front of her. But she's speaking about my Lord. That's an affectionate way of speaking about the Lord Jesus. But not only an affectionate way, it's a personal way and it underlines the personal relationship that exists between him and me. And the third time you find it in this Thomas, also in John 20, on the eighth day, that he says, my Lord and my God. So Thomas is convinced when he sees the Lord, and the Lord points to his hands and his side, then he's convinced and he says, my Lord and my God. One, a wonderful explanation was that. And that uh, Thomas is a picture of the future remnant who will be convinced when they will see the Lord Jesus when he comes again, according to Zechariah 13, for example. Whereas we live in the dispensation that it is by faith, that we can say, my Lord, it is by faith. Just as Elizabeth, she didn't see him yet, but she knew he's the mother of my Lord, that was faith. And that should mark us also. And that the first reference, there are only four references in the New Testament. My Lord, who said that? Paul, in Philippians 3, he wants to be more conformed to the Lord Jesus. He wants to learn more of him. He speaks about the Lord in the glory. And he says, Christ Jesus, my Lord. So he wants to be more conformed to him, who is now in the glory. And he wants to represent him here in this scene. And that is really a lesson for us also. So study those four times that these believers could say, my Lord. And I suggest to you we uh, identify especially with Paul's exclamation in Philippians 3. And then in verse 44, For behold, as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ear, the babe leaped with joy in my womb. We talked about that already, but here notice again the joy. What a wonderful joy is this. And let me say this in connection with joy. This word, gladness or joy, is found 14 times in the New Testament. And God wants us to be marked with joy. Like John the Baptist, as you have read in John 3, and here already in his mother's womb, this joy should mark us also. When we know something of the Lord Jesus, when we see, discover something more about him, as in John 3, we can also stand up and leap up as it were with joy. And then in verse 45, Blessed is she that has believed. I commented that already. Uh, that should be mark us also. We should be marked by faith, not by the things that we see. Uh, people today want to be impressed by miracles and by wonderful things and great events. But what really matters is whether we believe with our heart. And here Elizabeth would say of Mary, Blessed is she that has believed. For there shall be a fulfillment of the things spoken to her from the Lord. How wonderful is this that uh, Elizabeth's faith can show or can confirm there will be a fulfillment of the things spoken to you from the Lord. And that is something we need also. Uh, I was thinking of Abraham in Romans 4. Abraham, he was not weak in faith. There are seven points mentioned there in Romans 4 about Abram's faith, how great his faith was. And here we find Mary, a true daughter of Abram. We will find later in this book another daughter of Abram. He needed to be healed by the Lord Jesus. We will find the thought of sonship, and I tried this in. Sons and daughters. God wants those who enjoy the fellowship with him, who are mature. And so we find here Mary, a young girl, maybe 18 years old, we don't know for sure, a mature believer. And I was really struck with this when I saw this uh, and applied to myself. What did I do when I was 18 years old? How was I spiritually? Did I have this spiritual maturity as we find here in Mary? Of course, Elizabeth was an old sister. And that again is a beautiful thing. Here's an old sister with a young sister. They were relatives as we've seen in verse 36, but they have something in common and they share with one another. What a tremendous encouragement this is for us. We should put these things in practice. should be this fellowship between older and younger ones and this maturity that we find here and this faith she has believed. And uh, in John 20, when Thomas finally believed, he says, blessed is those who have not seen and believed. That is our portion for today and the challenge for us today this um, fulfillment that um, 
Elizabeth is speaking of was another confirmation or another encouragement, like the angel had already given encouragement, and this is another encouragement. And so we may encourage one another also, just like Elizabeth is encouraging Mary here. But then when we come to Mary's praise, that is much deeper. Um, we find Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she prays, she blessed, but Mary goes much further. And of Mary it's not said that she was filled with the Holy Spirit. Does that mean that she was not filled with the Holy Spirit? Because it is not said? I should submit to you that what happened to Elizabeth and later on with Zacharias, you find that the next time, Lord willing, the Holy Spirit put the words into their mouths. Whereas with Mary we see that it's her own words, her own words. But of course she was led by the Holy Spirit. Of course she was controlled by the Holy Spirit. Take the talent and let us, as young people also among us, let us enter into these things and let us get familiar with the Word of God. Mary, in her song, or in her doxology, in her praise, she quotes about 15 scriptures. She was saturated, with, her mind was saturated with the scriptures. And uh, there's a wonderful parallel with 1 Samuel 2, Hannah's praise. It is a wonderful parallel, and many words are very similar. And I just want to give four points here. In verse 46, 48, he starts with special praise to God. That is also a practical lesson for us. First, to praise God. And then verse 49 to verse 50, we'll just go over it briefly and then go into the details. She refers to God's power, God's holiness, and God's mercy. So again, she speaks about God. And then verse 50 to 53, she underlines especially God's sovereignty, how he would put down and how he would exalt the lowly. So the haughty ones are scattered and, and so on. So that is verse 51, 52, and 53. God's sovereignty, how he acts in sovereignty. And then she refers in verse 54 and 55 to special mercy and faithfulness of God. How he has helped Israel, his servant, and how he has remembered Mercy. So that is a reference to God's faithfulness. So this doxology really speaks about God. She's not speaking about herself. She speaks about God. What a, a wonderful example this is for us. Even for our prayers. Now, let's look into some of the details. First of all, before she starts to pray. No, uh, at, at the very beginning. Yes, she speaks about herself. Okay, so don't get me wrong. She speaks about herself. But it says in verse... 47, first she magnifies the Lord, and then she says, My spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has looked upon the low estate of his bondmen. So, bondmen. So, if, he, if she refers to herself, it is referring to God's action. That is what I really meant. And then later on in her song, she speaks in more detail about what God has done. Now, before we go into that doxology, I want to underline a very special word here in verse 47. My soul magnifies the Lord. And it really struck me to find this word magnify. Again, that is related to the word mega that I commented on earlier. And uh, later on, this word, this word is used also in uh, verse 58. Her neighbors and kinsfolk heard that the Lord had magnified his mercy with her. That is a reference to God's mercy with Elizabeth, and then the same word magnify to you. Let me say something about this word, this word magnify. I promise you I will not comment on every verb, but this is a very special verb that is used eight times in the New Testament. It's used once in connection with the Pharisees. They made their phylacteries, in Matthew 23, verse 5, the Lord says that they made their phylacteries great, or they magnified literally. The same verb is used, their phylacteries. That was something of the outward garb and garment they used in connection with their prayers. And they were very proud. So there you find the religious Jew proud in his religious action and magnifying these things. Really magnifying himself. Whereas these seven other references we find of this verb is the first here in Luke 1 verse 47. Mary magnifies the Lord. And then we find in verse 58, I commented on that, or I refer to that already, the Lord magnified his mercy in Elizabeth. Then we find in uh, Acts 5 about the early Christians that we find 
how there is the grace of God working. And again, that goes beautifully parallel with Luke's Gospel, Acts 5, verse 13. And the rest of the resters, no man joined himself to them, but the people magnified them. So instead of magnifying yourself like the Pharisees did, he, the people around the early Christians in Jerusalem, they magnified them because of their behavior. Then we find in chapter 10, verse 46, in the story of Cornelius, that God was magnified. In verse 46, they magnified God with the songs that God gave them. And Acts 19, verse 17, in Ephesus, those disciples, they magnified the name of the Lord Jesus. That's a wonderful thing. But when we come then to two more references, number 6 and 7, Paul's desire was, in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 15, and this is a challenge for us, there the people said, the opponents said, uh, sp spoke about Paul, that he made himself weak and so on. But he says in verse 15, when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged. So, Paul wanted the faith of the believers in Corinth to increase, to grow, and then he says that we shall be enlarged. So, that is the same word then, that together they would be magnified. That's a wonderful uh, desire. And the last one is really beautiful, in Philippians 1 verse 20, where Paul says, when he is in prison, what was his desire? That Christ would be magnified in his body, so that Paul's body would function like a magnifying glass, that others could see more of the Lord Jesus through Paul. Now, that is the kind of magnifying that Mary is doing in verse in Luke 1, verse 47. My soul magnifies the Lord. She had said, Behold the bondman, the bondmaid of the Lord. She was available. Soul, spirit, and body. And we find here that, here, in a threefold way, soul, spirit, and body, she is available for God, and God is magnified in her. Like I referred to Paul, his body was was functioning as a magnifying glass, that God would be glorified in him. That was his desire. And here we see that in actual fact with Mary. Mary is available, and her body is used. It becomes the fruit, her womb becomes the, the place for the fruit of the, of the womb, as we have seen in verse 42. Her body is used for the glory of God. Now she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. And then in verse 47 we see, and this, my spirit has rejoiced in God. I think this is a great challenge for us too, that body, soul, and spirit, that we would be available as instruments for the glory of God and magnify Him, make Him great. Then you see also in verse 47, my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Two comments, first of all here, a reference to her spirit. So that is, through our spirit we have very uh, special communion with God. The soul speaks of the place of the desire, and, well, I won't, don't want to get into the details of this now, but the soul is really uh, connected with our desires and needs, and there she says, let my soul magnify the Lord, but the Spirit, God is the Spirit, and through the Spirit we have fellowship with God. My Spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. And that brings me to the second point. Mary here, you've noticed the last time, she was object a very special object of the favor of God. She's not herself full of favor. God is full of favor. And he bestows this favor on her. And so in that context, it's important to see that she says, God, my Savior. It's not that she didn't need salvation. She had come to know God as her Savior. And even in connection with what Elizabeth did, Elizabeth praised the fruit of her womb as my Lord. In a similar way, you may think of what Mary does. Mary considers the fruit of her womb as God. So she realizes that the fruit of her womb will be a human person, Lord Jesus as man, would be at the same time God blessed forever, and he would be her Savior. She acknowledges this already. So look at her faith. Look at the example we find here in Mary. Instead of putting her on a pedestal, we see as an example for us. Now, verse 48, he has looked upon the low estate of his bondmaid. That is God's grace. He looks at the low estate. And so he will also change the bodies of our humiliation, Philippians 3, verse 21. And he will glorify our bodies. 
in Acts 8, verse 33, there is another reference to the low estate, and that's a very touching uh, reference. It's Acts 8, verse 33. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Here the same word is used. The same word that Mary uses here, low estate, he has looked upon the low estate of his bondmate, that same word is used here for the Lord Jesus himself. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Here we see how the Lord Jesus took the place of humiliation in the three hours of darkness. He took a low place. And then God could exalt him. Philippians 2. He was, he humbled himself, and then God exalted him. This is the similar thought we have here with Mary. Mary took a low place, and then God could exalt her. But notice again, she says, of his bondsmaid. I want to underline this, and we notice already a couple of challenges in Mary's example. And here again, this challenge. She is God's bondsmaid. Can I say this, I'm really God's bondservant? Can you say it, I am God's bondservant, bondmaid? This is a challenge for us. And we find, therefore, a wonderful example in Mary with this respect. So taking a low place, and then also be completely submissive, available, obedient, dependent on the Lord to be a vessel fit for the master's use. That is included. And then, in verse 48, she says, For behold, in the middle, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. Because she was the special object chosen by God, favored by God, and in that sense, all generations could call her blessed. And here again, the word is used, the same word as in the Beatitudes. So, happy. Everyone can really call her happy. In that sense, there is nothing wrong to call her blessed. But not look at her as a deity, or look at her as uh, the Immaculate Mary, or whatever concept there is, or the Queen of Heaven. That's not the thought at all. But that we should call her blessed. When we look at her, her example, when we see what a tremendous example she is for, for us, when we see that she was a vessel used by the Spirit of God, and that her womb was used to, that the Holy, the Holy Spirit would uh, produce this in her, as we have seen. And the last time we commented on this, that all these nine months, he was in a special way protecting her and leading her. In that sense, we may call her blessed. And then in verse 49, the mighty one has done to me great things. It is a beautiful thing. We find here how God acts in his providence, how God acts in his knowledge, in his omniscience. He knows everything, but he fulfills now his plans according to his might. God is the almighty God. And what God has planned in his wisdom from before the foundation of the world, he is now fulfilling as the almighty God. And so Mary could say, mighty one has done to me great things. And beloved, the mighty one is also available for us today to help us and to lead us on. And notice here again, great things. Great things. Again, the word great here. And then she refers to the holiness of God. Holy is his name. Uh, are we really impressed by the holiness of God? Today, we speak often in a haphazard way about God and about the Lord Jesus in a way that we don't really respect his holiness. But his holiness is really emphasized, especially in this gospel, in Luke's gospel, but also in Paul's writings that goes parallel with Leviticus. Leviticus, the Old Testament, put great uh, emphasis on God's holiness. And then she comments on his mercy, because God looks at his people, he knows their misery, and he bestows mercy on them. And that is why all the generations would call Mary blessed, because God has used her to be a special vessel. And let me say this before I forget, all generations, so that means also our generation, that means also the generations of our fathers, all generations of believers could call Mary blessed. And that brings me to this point. Every generation needs to learn certain important principles. And so the lessons that Mary has learned, in, in this she is an example for us, every generation has to learn. In that sense, every generation, having learned those lessons, can call Mary blessed. That's a great challenge for us, that we don't take things for granted, but that we learn these things, like Mary learned them, and then we can call her blessed. And then we can refer to what God has worked, 
God works, and Paul refers to that in his prayer, Ephesians 3, even abundantly, even more than we think. It is a wonderful prayer, referring to this might that God has to fulfill his thoughts and to fulfill also our prayers. And so his holiness is maintained. At the same time, he refers to his mercy. And that again to generations and generations, to them that fear him. That is not an automatic thing. It is to them that fear him. Fear of the Lord the beginning of knowledge. That is where it starts. And this fear, this fear is indispensable. Without that fear, there is no relationship with God. And so you, you don't have the next generation. Whereas in Timothy, Timothy, his name means honoring God, or together with the thought of the fear of the Lord. Timothy, Paul speaks about these generations, that he would pass on these things to the next generation, then to faithful men. They would pass it on to faithful men. They have the thought of generation. God wants these things to be passed from generation to generation. Now in this, the rest of her uh, doxology, there are seven points that I want to underline very briefly. He has wrought strength with his arm. Now notice, she always uses past tense. He has wrought strength. He has scattered body and so on. This a prophetic Aris. Aris is this past tense. So she uses the past tense, but at the same time there is this prophetic bearing. It is still future. So this is the wonderful richness of scripture that you can say that you can take a portion from the past, like Hannah's song, first Samuel two. Mary applies it to her situation, and still it has a future bearing, and the real fulfillment of it is still future, although it is presented here in past tense. It's a wonderful uh, aspect of the scripture, and that shows how, how God is really in control. He can speak using past tense, as if everything is already completed, and still it needs to be fulfilled. The, the Messiah still needs to be born, he still needs to walk on this earth, to suffer, to die, to, re to be raised from among the dead, to be exalted, and so on. All these things need to still happen. But faith knows this is a fact. And although time-wise it still needs to be fulfilled, it is a fact, and nothing can change the fulfillment because it is in the hands of the Almighty. And then in verse 51, I also want to emphasize the arm. You find the arm of God, for example, in the prophecies in Isaiah, the prophecies of the Lord. And there we see that the arm of the Lord, he equated with the Lord himself. So it is an amorphism, it is like uh, using a term connection with, in connection with hum, uh, human beings, and applying it to, it to God. But in Isaiah, the Lord and his arm is sometimes identified with the Lord himself. And so he used his arm to deliver his people, to protect his people, and so he acts for them. He scatters haughty ones in the thought of their heart. That's another point. God knows what's in the heart, and he takes care of that. He scatters the haughty ones. That's a very a challenging thought. Also, God knows exactly what is in our heart. If there is pride, if there is this heartiness, He will deal with it. God does not accept that. And you find that in many different settings. I was thinking of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, who had, be, had been placed by God over all these kingdoms, he became proud, and God had to deal with it. And so many examples could be given of this. Verse 52, He has put down rulers from thrones, but also exalted the lowly. The Lord Jesus he refers to the lowly in Matthew 11, verse 29. He himself was lowly. I commented on that earlier. He took a low estate, a low place, and he was also the lowly. And he can then help us to be lowly and in that way serve God. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty. That is amazing. So God's provisions are for those who are hungry. God's provisions are not for those who are rich. Laodicea. They thought they had everything. And we are living in the days of Laodicea. Let's not forget that. Rich and enriched, but in fact they were poor and naked. They didn't know it even. No insight. How terrible picture. So he cannot help the rich, but he can help the hungry. And in the psalm we see how he satisfies the hungry soul. The need, the, those who are aware of their needs, those who are hungry, and the Lord says in Matthew 5, those who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness, they will be filled. And so may we be found in this company. And then the last point, the seventh point, he has helped Israel. 
It's a beautiful thought. He is the advocate. He stands at the side of Israel. Israel is in great misery. And I forgot to mention that mercy, God's mercy, are the resources that are available for those who are in dire circumstances and who need his mercy. Of course, it's at the same time grace, but grace is a different emphasis. Grace emphasizes you don't deserve it. Whereas the mercy is God reaching out to those who are in dire circumstances in great need, like the people of Israel in Egypt, and like the people of Israel here, only a little remnant in the land. And even, we will see later in Luke 3, what a terrible situation it was. It's two high priests with foreign rulers and all these things. Yet, it says, he has helped Israel. So faith looks at God and sees the resources are in God. And so she comments on God's faithfulness in order to remember mercy. God is merciful. So that already to Moses in Exodus 32, after the golden calf. And so God is faithful to remember mercy. As he spoke to our father, to Abram and to his seed forever. And that leads me then to this other point. I said, the Lord Jesus is seen as the seed of the woman. But here we see that he is the representative of his people as Abram's seed. Matthew 1 shows he is the seed of Abram, he is the seed of David. And so what I would like to suggest to you, you find here God's mercy and favor so that the promise already given in Genesis 3, the seed of the woman, could be fulfilled. We find the Lord Jesus, the seed of Abram, that these promises and the mercy can be accomplished and, uh, and uh, get, that God can show this mercy to his people. And then in connection with David, the seed of David, he is going to be the king. We have noticed that the last time in verse 35, verse 32 already, he shall be great and shall be called son of the highest and the Lord shall give him the throne of David his father. So there we see this uh, coming reign already indicated and verse 35 also he shall be uh, the holy thing which shall be born shall be called son of God. Again, they have emphasis on holiness. But there we see him as the son of David. That is in connection with his kingdom. And that is also an important point for us to realize. The Lord Jesus is the seed of David. And so he will establish all these things that God has in mind in connection with the kingdom. He's the seed of Abram. That we find uh, the matter of mercy and all that is brought out in connection with Abram, and all these promises that God gave, Genesis 12, for example, it, they will be fulfilled, and the Lord is also the seed of the woman, and there we see a scene of misery, and just after the fall, Genesis 3, God speaks of the seed of the woman, and so here we find the fulfillment, and we see also the Lord is called the royal seed, the royal seed maintains God's right, and he's called the holy seed, where we find especially God's sovereignty, now God will maintain his thoughts even in days of great difficulty, as here in Luke 1. In dark days, when you read John, uh, excuse me, Isaiah 6, you find at the end of Isaiah 6, that there is a scene of destruction that comes over the people, yet God will have his holy seed. And so it is in connection with the Lord Jesus. God was going to have his holy seed. And so also Israel now is seen as this seed. And that is an uh, application he can make for us. If the Lord Jesus is seen, first of all, as the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, the seed of David, we may apply it then to us also, that we may be seen in these different perspectives. So verse 55 confirms Mary's faith, and then she concludes her doxology with this, to Abraham and to his seed forever. That is what faith does. Faith looks to God and knows that everything is in his hands, and everything is secure. And then verse 56 comments on the fact that she abode there for three months. So imagine that for three months these sisters had fellowship with one another. We get sick and tired of one another when we stay with each other for one week. They were spending time for three months. But why didn't they get sick and tired of each other? Because they were occupied with these wonderful things. And that is the key for us today too. How can we have fellowship? How can we have joy together? When we are occupied with these things, then we won't get sick and tired of each other. And then she returned to her house. So we'll pick this up the next time, Lord willing, from verse 57. So this wonderful doxology is a great challenge for us. 
Now, I, I challenge you to also compare this with 1 Samuel 2, to go into the details and see how well Mary was versed in the scriptures and how she quotes these scriptures and applies it then to this situation. That is another wonderful lesson for us, to be able to take the scriptures and apply them to the situation we find ourselves in. Now, if there are questions or points to uh, add, uh, please let's use the time for that. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. <coughs> and um, it goes beyond the parameters of your presentation this evening. But at the beginning of Luke's gospel, we have the, it begins with the temple scene, and the people are outside, so to speak. The priest is inside, and the people are outside. And eventually, the priest cannot speak. He keeps the priest out there. At the end of Luke's gospel, there's another temple scene. Uh, all the disciples are inside and they're uh, singing praise and thanksgiving to God. Yes. The book begins with the temple scene and it closes with the temple scene. And in between, we have got all this uh, temple scene, the Lord Jesus Christ in the midst of the temple. What was the difference from the beginning of the temple scene closing with the temple scene? The people outside at the beginning and at the end, they're all together the same thing. Um, well, first of all, let me tie it in with the thought of doxology. Temple has to do with worship. And so what I commented on tonight is that theology fits well in with this whole idea of temple service. But now to answer your uh, question or your point, it's very significant really that it starts with a temple that is close to the people. The people is, are standing outside. Only the priest can go inside and he's done. He does not believe. He cannot speak. He cannot even hear. Whereas at the end of Luke's Gospel, and that is one of the uh, ways that Luke is using, Luke works by way of contrast. He sometimes compares, he's parallel, and sometimes you learn important lessons by way of contrast. And so when you come to the end of Luke's gospel, you see, find another temple scene, then the people are inside, they are not dumb and deaf, but they are praising God. So, in other words, I see there's an illustration from the situation of Judaism,